Hello folks, this is Professor Watts again, and I'm going to walk you through a homework problem that deals with calculating real GDP growth, labor productivity, and productivity growth. And then we'll briefly take a, a look at thinking about changes in the capital stock and their effect on GDP growth. To make this very easy for us, we're going to do everything within Excel. And I highly recommend whenever you get a uh, homework problem that asks you to do these kind of calculations, go ahead and use Excel. You'll make sure you get the math right, and you can make nice graphs and, and make a nice output of your, of your solved work. So okay, we have a homework problem um, similar to this that gives us uh, two years. And they're different years, so the data is going to be a little different, but the procedure will be exactly the same. So I've, I've chosen 2014 and 2015, and we've got aggregate hours worked in the economy for each year, and then we've got real GDP for each year, both in billions of dollars. Now, just in case you're curious as to where I got this data, this is the actual data for 2014 and 15. And it took me about five minutes to get it, and I get all, almost all of my economic data from a, a site called FRED, Federal Reserve Economic Data. It's a it's a huge database of basically any economic indicator on the U.S. and actually uh, foreign economies as well, compiled by the Federal Reserve, Bank of St. Louis, and it's they've got a great website that's um, that's pretty user friendly. So I went to the site and I did a search string here, hours, because I didn't know exactly which what the title of the series would be, but if I search hours, everything of dealing with hours comes up, and I scrolled through here. I don't want average hours; I want total hours. So eventually came down here. And I find this this one here, hours of wage and salary workers on non-farm payrolls total. So that's what we're interested in here, the total hours worked per year. And you'll notice this one, this one's the annual one. This one appears quarterly, the only difference. We could, we could get the same data from either one, but go ahead and uh, select this. And you see there's the data for 2014. You can, uh, you can download this data. You can actually click here to get the, the last five years worth, or you can actually scroll over the line on the graph to get the number for each year. It's, a, it's really convenient user-friendly. Let me show you one more thing here. You can also use the slider bar to zoom in or out on a range of the data. And then down here, there's all kinds of transformations you can do. You can change colors. You can, um, you can then take and cut and paste this output into uh, projects or presentations. And uh, this is something that professional economists really use this data a lot. So that's where I grabbed the data, and I grabbed it for uh, hours total hours worked. Then I also uh, searched uh, GDP and found the real gross GDP uh, numbers for 2014-15 as well. Copied all of that into my spreadsheet. So that's where this actual data came from. Okay, so that being said, now we're ready to, to tackle this problem. And here's the things that the problem asks us to do. Growth rate of real GDP, labor productivity, productivity growth, and then a GDP doubling time applying a rule of 70 concept. And we'll do all this work within Excel. It'll be very uh, straightforward. So first off, growth rate of real GDP. Let me put in a little reminder of how we calculate the uh, growth rate, percentage growth rate for anything, whether GDP or, or how fast your hair is growing, for that matter. Uh, it's just going to be the, the second variable, x2 minus the first, or the, the second observation minus the first, divided by the first, times 100. Now in Excel, we won't have to say times 100 because we'll just tell Excel to display it as a percent. Okay, so how do we do that in Excel? It's very simple. I'm just going to go over here and type in equals, open parentheses, and then select my cell containing the x2, the second observation, which is my 2015 number. Subtract the first observation, x1, close the parentheses, and then divide that by the first observation. Enter. And I've got a number. Now multiply it by 100, or just have Excel display it as a percentage and let's add a couple decimals. So we've got 2.43% GDP growth. And I'll go ahead and highlight all the answers here. Okay, so moving on, labor productivity. What is labor productivity? That's simply the GDP, which is a measurement of total output, you'll remember, divided by the hours it took to produce that output. And, and this will basically work out to a number that, that tells us uh, output per hour. We're talking about dollars worth of new output produced per hour of labor in the economy. So this will be very straightforward to do in Excel. For 2014, it's always going to be a cell reference. We're going to take the, the GDP, which is cell C3 right there, and then we're going to divide it by the hours worked. So we've got 66, and that is a, uh, it's a dollar's worth. So I'm going to format that as money, and it automatically goes to two decimal points. Now, note here that uh, the reason I can take this cell divided by this cell is because both of these data are expressed in billions. So when they're, they're in commensurate units. If they weren't, I might have to convert them. So if hours were in millions and GDP were in billions, I would have to convert one or the other so they were both in the same units. But since they're in the same units already, uh, we're good to go.
Okay, now, hopefully you know that in Excel, if you want to have the same formula applied to, to the same data one, one column over, you don't have to type the whole formula again. You just get your crosshairs here, and you drag it. And you'll notice that when I click on this, it's not doing D3 divided by D2. Okay, so our productivity went from $66.99 worth of uh, output per hour in, in 14 up to $67.25 of output per hour in 2015. So there we go, productivity data. Moving on to productivity growth rate. Same growth rate concept here. Now just apply to these two productivity numbers. Of course, we can't do that for 2014 because we would need the previous year, but we can do it for 2015. And that's simply going to be the 2015 productivity number minus the 2014 productivity number, x2 minus x1, divided by the base, which is the 2014 number. And again, we need to tell Excel to format that as a percent, not a dollar value. So we have 0.38%, roughly 0.4% labor productivity growth. OK. Moving right along. Now, let's think about how long would it take for GDP to double using a rule of 70 concept at the actual rate that we just calculated, which is 2.43%. So let me refresh our memory on how the rule of 70 works. You'll recall that the rule of 70 says 70 divided by R, where R is the growth rate, R equals percent growth rate, 70 divided by R equals years to double for whatever we're, whatever growth process we're observing here. So it could be GDP, it could be uh, bacteria growing in a petri dish, it could be the growth rate of um, of a population of, of people, right? So anything that grows at a constant rate, we can apply the rule of 70 to get a really good approximation, especially the, for smaller R's. If, if your R is say 10% or less, this approximation works out really well. Once your R gets larger, this this kind of breaks down. But GDP growth rates historically have ranged, have uh, averaged in the United States about 2 two to 4%. So thinking about GDP growth is a very apt application of the rule of 70. So all we need to do is say 70 divided by our rate here. Ah, now I have, an, I have a little problem here because my rate here is expressed as a percent. And so and, and not just a, a raw number. So make a slight adjustment. So it's it's not going to be 2,800 years. So let's just recalculate this. It's just 70 divided by, and let's express the percent as just a number now, 2.43. The 28.8 years sounds much more realistic. And I want to take some decimals out of that. If you put your work in Excel, it's an, a nice thing to do for your instructor to highlight the answers. Okay, the final part says, how long will it take for real GDP to double if the growth rate is twice as much as the actual growth rate we just observed here. So let's uh, let's go down here and just say equals two times our actual growth rate. And so our, our new rate is 4.85%. So that's, that's just in there for reference purposes. And again, I'll take 70 divided by 4.85. And of course, it's going to be half the number of years at our existing growth rate. We double the growth time, we have the number of years according to the rule of 70 formula. So I'm going to highlight that, take some decimals out. <clears throat> the second part of our problem asks us to think about how changes in uh, human and physical capital affect the growth rate of GDP. And it wants us to, to graph these things. It's, it's not very clear exactly what it wants us to do. So we, let me give you some guidance. Um, now, now, first off, you know, we might think, well, how do we measure physical and human capital? And again, let me go back to Fred and just show you. Uh, Fred has all this data. So I typed in capital stock, and I, I found a uh, data series for capital stock at constant national prices for the U.S. up through 2011. And it says we have $40 million, million so what would that be? Trillions, right? So um, thousands would be billions. So you have $40 trillion worth of capital as of 2011. And that makes sense if you think about what GDP is, about 16 trillion. Uh, we have about, what, two and a half times that in capital um, because a, a lot of this capital is long lived goods. Think factories, think highways, think uh, cars and trucks and, and railroads and things like that that have been built up over time and are persistent. So yeah, we've got a lot more um, dollars worth of capital out there than we have dollars worth of annual production. Okay, so we can, we can actually measure the capital stock, and here's a graph of the growth in measured capital stock over time. And likewise, now human capital is a little trickier because human capital, we have to somehow capture 
the uh, knowledge, skills, training, etc., of people, and that's not as that's not directly valued in the way capital is in, in asset markets. So, well, we have to use something like an index. And I, I found on on Fred this index of human capital, and this is one I actually wasn't familiar with. So I went down here, clicked on the notes, and it talks about how um, it's based on years of schooling and returns to education. So there, this is an index that has to take some inputs and and do some modifications to come up with a uh, unitless number that indicates changes in the human capital stock over time. So this is more of an estimate. It would be a little more slippery than this measured asset value capital stock for physical capital, but it would still be pretty useful for us if we really wanted to to model the impact of changes in human capital and physical capital on growth. Now, we're not going we're not doing that in this class. We're we're doing things at a much simpler level. So I'm just pointing to these as a reference that you, you, you can measure these okay, and you can get this data. But for our purposes, we'll do something a lot more simple. So I'm going to open up a fresh sheet in Excel here. I'm just going to start some uh, some columns and I'm just going to make up some numbers. I'm going to start one called physical capital. And in economics, we use K as, a, as an uh, indicator for that variable. So we'll say physical capital, physical K, and then human capital. We'll say human K. So this, there's our indicators for physical and human capital and frankly here for now we'll just make up some numbers starting at zero and we'll go up in increments of let's say 10 units and if this, if this is physical capital you know you might you might think we're uh, saying um, you know millions of dollars worth of uh, capital in, in terms of asset values okay so there's our physical capital measured in millions of, of dollars worth and let's just go up in 10 unit increments and to make this process simple. I'm not going to type in 10, 20, 30. I'm going to type in the previous cell plus 10 and then I'm just going to fill it down. Okay now human capital likewise will have an index, a unitless index number to think about uh, aggregating human capital levels and again we'll, we'll just go and let's say units of our actual data set over here was it's, it's, uh, we're at 3.6 this is a per person thing. So uh, we could do it that way. We could multiply that by the population. There's a lot of different ways we can do this, but let's just say, uh, let's just start it again at zero. And this time we'll move up in increments of, of 0.1. So I'm gonna say this equals the previous cell plus 0.1. And then again, I'll populate that down as far as I've populated the other one. So I've got physical capital going from zero to um, $500 million worth, and I've got the index number going from zero to five. And now we can use those in a really basic production function to, to say, as those grow, what happens to output? So we'll call this output or GDP. Let's call this, let's call this real GDP. A, a really basic formula that we use to, to capture this idea of diminishing marginal returns, because the idea is we, if we add more capital alone, the returns eventually kind of peter out because we need to add uh, other inputs in proportion. We need to add land and, and labor or human capital in proportion. So if we just added cap physical capital alone, we have, it, we'd get less and less and less extra output out of it. Likewise with human capital. So basically what we're getting at is we've got a output function. We've got an output function that's going to look something like this. If we measure or if, if we think about the function of output GDP here on the vertical, as a function of capital, physical and human capital, we'll combine them both when we actually uh, create a, a formula. It's going to look like this. When we add the, the first initial units of capital, it's going to grow s steeply, but as we add more and more capital, then if we're up here at a very high level of capital, as we're adding more capital, we get less and less and less extra output. And it's going to have this kind of shape, and this is what we would indicate as a diminishing returns function or diminishing marginal returns I often abbreviate that a DMR it's a very familiar concept to us in economics so what kind of functional form captures that well something like y equals the square root of x captures that really nicely so what we would want to do is y of course is GDP and x will have x1 maybe the square root of x1 plus the square root of x2 and this would be the physical capital and this would be the uh, human capital, right? So we can actually create a, an Excel formula and then plot the numbers based on this uh, actual observed growth in physical and human capital stocks. And then we can have Excel make us a nice pretty little graph of such. So let's do that. Let's set up a little function that says real GDP 
equals our physical capital stock at that ob observation level uh, to the to the 0.5 power, which is the same thing as square root, of course, plus the human capital index at that level, again to the to the one half power, which is the same as square root. And of course, any zero to any power is zero, but as we populate this down, and I can double click my crosshair to have it go all the way down, match equal to what I've uh, entered for my other values, and we'll uh, take some decimals out of that. We don't need that many decimals. And as when we graph that, then and let me select that data range. And then Excel makes graphing so easy. You just insert a line graph, put a title on it, and again the real GDP here. You know, let's note that this is maybe in in uh, millions or billions of, of dollars. You know, billions in 2009 dollars. And if we wanted to make our our graph nice and fancy, we we maybe put that in here on the axis title, billions 2009 dollars, and over here we'll say something like capital inputs aggregate. Okay, and, and does our graph look like it's supposed to? Featuring diminishing marginal returns, it sure does. And one nice thing you can also do in Excel, once that graph is created, if you change the underlying data, so for instance if I say, well let's, you know, maybe um, maybe human capital has a larger multiplier, so I put a 2 coefficient in front of that than, uh, than human capital does, than physical capital does rather. Yeah, that's what I wanted to do, two times. And then I fill that down. And you'll notice it changed the shape of that output function. Actually, let's make that multiplier bigger so we get a, a stronger effect. I'm going to say four times. And when I fill that formula all the way down, you'll see it change the graph formula automatically. So that's a really easy way to make the graph. But in Excel, you have to have some underlying data and then some kind of formula to create that data. Sometimes it'll be given to you. Sometimes you'll have to make it up. That's what we just did. The data is actually available to you. Places like Fred, yeah, that's just kind of more of an FYI. If you want to do your homework in this manner in Excel, I would uh, welcome it and encourage it. You pick up some Excel skills along the way. And uh, I will also make the kind of a template file here available to you to reference when you're doing this homework assignment.